Well, here we are. I'm excited. Doesn't sound like it, but I, I really am. <laughs> this week was kind of a, a realization of sorts. Uh, something we'd been, my wife and I had been praying about for a good long time. Um, and trying to make sense of my office, uh, trying to make sense of the way things have have been done, the new tasks that need to be done, trying to remember names, um, bear with me on that, and, uh, and now to stand here, I am just incredibly excited. Amen. I, however, and I know this is a little cliche, I'm not terribly excited about the weather. I know, like, that's the easiest spot for us to go, like, that's the icebreaker, oh, how about that? Uh, but I'm not excited about it at all. And as Minnesotans, we all know what those things are up on that screen, don't we? Did anyone get to use them this week? Yes? We'll, we'll pray for you. <laughs> you know, my car was none too eager to start this week. I don't know about yours. Uh, it lives outside, <laughs> so it, it wasn't exactly eager to start. You know, and so we live in Minnesota. We know that sometimes those cables need to then come out of the trunk. But then there's other reasons we have to use them as well. Scripture says that we can confess our sins to one another. Anyone else ever left the dome light on overnight? <laughs> left the lights on overnight? Most of us. And so the cables come out of the trunk. The mechanic told me in the spring of this year that, that my car needed a new battery. And so in my wisdom, I thought, nah, no, that's it, only his job, it's only his profession. He can't possibly be right. So I didn't. I thought to myself, well, you know, I just put a battery in my wife's car yesterday. And I've got a manual transmission, so I'll just park on a hill, <laughs> and all will be well. And so the cables come out of the trunk. <laughs> the, the spirit was willing, but the flesh wasn't able, so to speak. And, and we know that when that happens, it, the battery might kind of still be good, but it just needs a little bit of encouragement. It just needs a little more strength. It just needs that jump start, right? To get it going, to get it to do what it is supposed to do. And we can be like that sometimes as well. Everyone, what, you and me and every person who has ever gathered breath has failed up to live to their intended purpose at some point in life. Some of us, it's every day. Scripture tells us that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All, everyone has sinned and fallen short. We're, you know, the, the car, its purpose is to what? The engineer designed it to take us from point A to point B. And God has a purpose for all of us as well. And sometimes we just don't live up to that purpose. For whatever reason, we fail to be the people that our Father in Heaven designed us to be. And oddly enough, some of the things that plague us are the same things that go wrong with your car. You know, the car fails to start because it's too cold, right? If you actually lived in Arizona or central Australia, if it's too hot, the battery will fail as well. You know, so, so sometimes it, it fails to live up to its intended purpose because of the externals. Sometimes the things around us cause us to not live up to our intended purpose either. And sometimes it's, well, it's like leaving the dome light on. We work things just a little bit too hard. We don't spend, we don't cross all the T's and dot all the I's and, and things just don't work the way that they're supposed to. Or maybe sometimes it's, well, like me. You don't do the proper maintenance. Things are getting weak and so you don't, you, you just didn't take care of it well and so it can't live up to its intended purpose. 
And so maybe this morning, you're, uh, you're at a place in your life where you just need a jump start. A little encouragement. A, a, a little boost to help you live up to your purpose. To be the you that God created you to be. And realistically, there is no better time than today. Because we've arrived at a new year. You know, it's a time that we make resolutions, right? It's a time where we say, I'm going to change the way that I live my life. I'm going to change some of the things that I do. I'm going, to, I'm going to get rid of bad habits and I'm going to start good habits. Did anyone make New Year's resolutions? Not a one? Okay, I got one. We're not alone, all right? We've got one another. Well, that makes my next question a little more simple to answer. So I guess this is just between you and me and everyone else that hears it. Uh, (laughs) I couldn't start a new year in the middle of the week, right? Because New Year's Day was, what, Wednesday? Yeah, I'm afraid we're going to have to just kick it down the road a few more days and start these new resolutions on Sunday or on Monday. Because we're creatures of habit. We're comfortable... uh, Even stuck in the ruts that we get stuck in. Comfort and familiarity are important to us. I've been in seminary for three and a half years. I still sit in the same seat. Three and a half years. I'm sure no one is sitting in their regular pew. Right? And so again, here we are. It's a new year. A new pastor. A new sermon series. New resolutions. And a new opportunity to align our will in our lives with the will and the mission of our Heavenly Father. And we aren't just talking about in just this area of life or just that area of life. We're talking about jump-starting really the totality of who we are. And we're not just talking external changes. We, We aren't just treating the symptom It's our intention to address its cause. What we're really talking about here is transformation. We're talking about letting the power and the love of Christ work in and through us. And so over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to cover several topics. We're going to talk about jump-starting our marriages, jump-starting our our families, our relationships, our mission, our work. But first today, we begin with faith. Faith. You know, how can we make this year different, both as individuals and as a congregation? How can we grow in in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord? How can we jumpstart our faith? That's the question we're going to try and answer this morning. And so if you have your Bibles with you or you care to pull out a pew Bible, we're going to go uh, to Ephesians chapter 5. We're only going to read a few verses in there. And so before we do that, let me just set this passage up a little bit. Ephesians is kind of a unique, uh, a unique setting because this letter is well, to Ephesus, but he's not really writing to fix a problem. Like if you were to read, say, 1 Corinthians, Paul is absolutely fixing some stuff that they've got wrong. But this letter, Ephesians, is more a letter of encouragement and saying, you guys are doing some things right, and he's building them up. He's edifying the body of Christ there in Ephesus. He's giving them uh, encouragement how to live, how to grow in their faith, and, and, and he's being, well, he, he, he shows them how the world is. He does this interesting contrast between darkness and light, and that theme continues on into where we're going to pick up in Ephesians 5. And so let's go ahead and read that. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, he says, Be very careful then. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You know, at first glance, it might not appear as though that passage, those few verses, really have much to say about this whole idea of jump-starting our faith. But if you stick with me just a little bit, I assure you that it does. For example, take a look there at verse 15. It says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. 
wise. It's be very careful how you live. See, how you live is the outpouring of belief. Paul isn't just saying, don't simply believe rightly. It's more than just believing rightly. It's more than just having some faith. He says it's how you live. It's not just make a commitment to Christ and, and, and be baptized and, and, and go on living the way that you used to. It's more than that. Be very careful then how you live. Live. And, and Paul's being nice here. Not as unwise, but as wise. He's being nice. What's the opposite of wise? I mean, the easy answer is unwise. There's a, foolish. Paul's saying, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool, be wise by how you live. The book of James gives us insight into this as well. You know, because I could stand up here realistically. The easy route would be to say, well, if you really want to jumpstart your faith, here's what I need you to do. I need you to, to read your Bible every day. And I need you to start and close your day with prayer and, uh, and come to church every week. And then everything is just going to be fantastic. Without giving any mention as to how we might do something like that. But instead, James tells us this. In the book of James, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and, after immediately looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now that's kind of a weird illustration that James uses there. The fact of the matter is, when we dive into the Word of God, that's, that's what we're doing. When we dive into the Word of God, we, we're reminded of who we really are. When we dive into God's Word, when we, when we read Scripture, when we spend time in prayer, we're changed by that. You know, the, the first time I, I got to share a message with you all, we talked about the power of story about how its story changes us. And here in, in James, he's saying, look, don't just read the words on the page. Well, actually, they didn't have the pages then. They had scrolls, and, and most people didn't own them. So they sat there, they'd sit in the synagogue, and, and priests would read Scripture. And so it's don't just listen to what they say. Do what they say. We're, when we dive into Scripture, we're reminded of who we are. We're reminded of how amazing our God is. We're reminded that we are no longer constrained by the powers of sin. We are reminded, just as we were with the Lord's Supper, that we are new creations in Christ. That's an amazing thing. And it's easy to forget. It is easy to forget. And so what do we do then? Do we stand there in the mirror... Scripture tells us that, that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That it, that it divides joints and marrow. That it separates soul from spirit. And that the word of God lays bare the conditions of our heart. Do we, do we come into that relationship with the word of God, catch a glimpse of who we really are, catch a glimpse of who God really is, catch a glimpse of what he wants us to do, what he has equipped us to do, and then walk away and go back to the way that things were. It doesn't need to be that way. Do we need to read scripture? Absolutely. Do we need to, to speak with the Father? Notice how it isn't speak to. We need to leave time for God to respond. Do we need to speak with the Father in prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should we come to gather with our fellow believers to, to worship and to praise and, and to build one another up? Absolutely. But in addition to those things, our lives should be a testimony to the fact that we've been resurrected, that we are changed because we are a part of God's story. Don't just hear the word. Do 
what it says. And so going back to Ephesians 5, he says, Don't be foolish, but instead be wise. All right, Paul? Don't be foolish, but be wise. How do I go ahead and do that? I told you that we get to the how part. And so here's, here's what he says. Don't be unwise, be wise, and make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I want to make just a couple of really quick notes here. Uh, both of them are incredibly practical, and they're from experience in my life. And so my guess is you've experienced them as well. First is that make the most of every opportunity. That's an important one. Is, is anyone good at wasting time? I am an expert at wasting time. Does anyone uh, like to watch movies, television, kill time on the internet, Facebook, video games? As a culture, the bulk of us, I would say the whole of us, are fantastic at wasting time. <laughs> Scripture tells us to make the most of every Make the most of every opportunity. Not just some of them. Make the most out of all of them. Every one. Are we taking the time to align ourselves with God? Are we taking the time to spend speaking with God in prayer? Are we taking the time to share with, well, with one another? We live loud lives. The television's always on, the radio's always on. And if it's not, the phone is out, the tablet's out, the computer's out. We live loud lives. Are we taking that time to be still and know that I am God? The second thing I wanted to bring up out of this was that we need to have the right perspective it, uh, on our lives, in our lives. And here's what I mean. Who knows the day or the hour of Christ's return? Who knows the number of his days? Nobody. So what does that mean? Today might be the day. No, today might be the day. It might be the day for an individual. Or it really might be the day when Christ calls all those who call him Lord home. That should change the perspective. That, that should change the way that we live our lives. I remember preaching a message talking about, and I'll, I'll challenge you in the very same way. Start your day with reminding yourself that today might be the day. Because it really might. You know, all of a sudden, seizing every opportunity might be just a little bit easier because it might be the day. Those few minutes spent uh, uploading things to Facebook or, you know, those could have been a few minutes that you got to play with your kids. Those could have been a few minutes that you could have told your spouse that you love them. That TV show could have gone unwatched and that Bible be, could, could have become read. Seize every moment. On your drive to work, that radio morning show could have given way to a conversation with God. That's one of my favorite places. You can pray with your eyes open. That's one of my favorite places to pray. Just shut the radio off. Nobody's going to hear you. They might think you're crazy. And just talk with God. And then Paul goes on. Why should we seize every opportunity? It says, because the days are evil. They are. They are. It doesn't take long for a full battery to run down when the alternator quits working. Does it? The world around us is a tough place. Life can just be brutal. And relationships can be, well, they can be hurtful. And they can be just emotionally draining on us. 
So doing the right thing, growing in that grace and knowledge of the Lord, being wise and not foolish, that can be tough when we're surrounded with the evil in the world. You know, it's tough to have clean speech like Mike talked about last week. It's tough to have clean speech with the language that's on television. You know, it's tough to have clean thoughts with the images that we're bombarded with on television and the inter- really just everywhere. And so what do we need to do? We need to continue to fill up those spiritual batteries, right? Keep that alternator running. We not only read the Word of God and do what it says, but we remain, we remain cognizant of the fact that today might be the day. And we never let our guard down. One of the more famous things that, that Paul said, is he says it in Ephesians 6.12, just a little bit down the page, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, because this evil exists, because this is happening, put on the full armor of God. There is a battle going on. And that passage is strange, and it's tough to make sense of. And what exactly is he talking about, and what does that look like? But there's a battle that's been waged. In 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 13, it says, it's plain as day. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, things aren't going to get better, it says. Deceiving and being deceived. Persecution doesn't always mean that the believer is going to be hunted by men or persecuted by governments. Persecuted doesn't always mean that belief or faith are going to be illegal. It can also mean that we will be spiritually attacked. That our weaknesses and that our our sinful tendencies are exploited to bring us down, to distance us from the Father. Scripture tells us that this this is happening. And I realize it sounds strange. We can't see it. We can't really comprehend it. But yet, the Word of God tells us it's happening. There was a saying I heard a long time ago. I don't know where it came from. And it said the, you know, now that I, I think it was gone in 60 seconds is where I remember it from. And he says, you know, the greatest trick that the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Sometimes being aware that the enemy's there and that he's working, we're, we're that much more aware of it. We can keep our guard up. We can be active in fighting that good fight. Keep those batteries full so the the cold and the dark don't run them down. And finally, here's the last thing that Paul says in our passage this morning. He says, Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. The will of the Lord is both general and specific. I don't know what his will is for some of the specifics of your life. There are plenty of times where I don't know what his will is for the specifics of my own life. But in the general sense, bigger than those little things, I know that the will of God is that we come to him and that we are transformed by the power of his spirit, that we come to know more. John 17, 3 says, this is a a prayer of Jesus. He's getting ready to go to the cross and he says, This is eternal life, that they know you and Christ Jesus whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that they may know you. It is our Father's will that we come to know him more and more, that that our faith be jump-started, that we grow, that we love God, and that we love one another because of the love that he first showed us. 
So now there are what? 360 days left in 2014. What are you going to do with them? Many of you said that you didn't make resolutions. That means I've got room to maybe push some on you. I, I want to challenge you to jumpstart your faith this year. You know, what are the things we normally make resolutions for? I want to spend more time with my family. Actually, that one usually comes down the road a little ways. Usually it's I want my sweater to fit better, right? It's I want to get in better shape or I want to eat healthy or I want to manage my funds better. I want to finally get to that hobby that I bought all the stuff for and haven't started working on in three years. Shouldn't our faith be more important? If we want to improve on the externals, let's work on the internals. You want to become a better husband, a better father, a better mother, a better wife? Start with your relationship with God. If you want to value yourself, like get fit, right? The body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Go to God's word and see who God says you really are. When you come to this and you, you really believe what God says about you, how he loves you, so much so that he sent his son to die for you, there's some self-worth in that. If you want to change the outside, start on the inside. Resolve to building up the interior. Allow the Holy Spirit to work. Seize those moments to grow in your faith. Seize those moments. Go to the Word and be reminded of who you really are in the eyes of the Lord. Go to Him. Come to Him and be renewed and be energized and then go out into that world and do what it says. One of my resolutions was to try and keep these under 35 minutes. And I could continue. Because it, it's a big task. There are many times where I kind of need a kick in the shorts to get things going. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. And so here we come to, to worship, to praise, and to be encouraged, to be edified, to be built up, to go and become the people that God knows that we can be.